Good morning. It is Wednesday, February 16th. Welcome into the Morning Medical Update and for joining us here on Facebook and on YouTube. Even though our COVID infection numbers have dropped, they are still the highest they've been since the start of the pandemic in many parts of the state. Rural areas in particular are still struggling. And this morning, we're going to talk about the impact COVID is still having on hospitals and rural communities. Joining us is John Warden. He is the interim administrator at our Great Bend campus and also Dr. Sherry Vaughn, the associate chief medical officer for our health system. Plus, we're also joined in studio by Dr. Tim Williamson. He's a pulmonologist here at the health system and physician VP of quality and safety and also Dr. Jackie Highland, she's a CMO at St. Francis, who is going to discuss the impact rural COVID cases are having on our health system overall. In COVID headlines this morning and around our Kansas City community, the Liberty School District joins a growing list of districts no longer requiring students to wear a mask. Board members cited cases that are going down and fewer absences. The new policy takes effect on Friday. Meanwhile, Johnson County Commissioners will decide today to continue with or to allow the mask mandate for K through six to expire. Regardless of the vote, student, students are still required to wear them on the bus. Olathe and Gardner Edgerton have already relaxed the mandates in their district. Kansas City Mayor Quentin Lucas does not plan to ask the city council to extend the face mask mandates for students in all school districts within the city limits. Now, earlier this week, Blue Valley, Independence, and North Kansas City schools also removed the face mask requirement. All schools are still, though, encouraging students students to wear them. So make sure you get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right here on your screen. So let's get on over to infectious disease physician, Dr. Nathan Barr, joining us this morning with our COVID count. Good morning. Nice to see you. It's been a while. It has been a while. I've been just, you know, relaxing. I know. <laughs> and we, put, we just called it a bat. Nice to see you. Well, um, yeah, cases are ha have been certainly going down, but man, we still have a lot of um, patients sick with COVID in our hospital. Um, 55 active cases, 11 of those in the ICU, six of those on ventilator, but 134 total patients still um, sick with with uh, COVID total. That so that includes active patients and also people that have um, they're out of that active phase, but still need hospitalization because of COVID. So you know. Hearing cases are going down, that's great, but I think we got to remember 134, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of times that would have terrified us in this pandemic, so we shouldn't act like we're all good. We're not all good. That makes sense. Um, I want to get to reporter questions, but Dr. Williamson, good to have you today. Good morning. Thanks. So today I got a big, big old surprise. I've been so used to talking about um, kids and students in the upper grades, you know, not, you know, having optional uh, mask policies in their school. And this morning, my eight-year-old said, mom, guess what? We get to take our masks off on Friday. And I was like, ah, you know, and so we were just talking about this off the top of the show. And it just like, it just kind of hit me. <laughs> wow, we're there. Should we be there? Well, you know, <clears throat> we're going to stay consistent. The pillars of infection control still work. And one of the key ones of those is masks. And um, as a father, my kid is uh, in still in school is 16, and my other uh, daughter is 18. Um, and I still very much want them wearing masks, mm -hmm. and I think it's still incredibly important. Yes, the cases are coming down, but as Dr. Barr mentioned, they're still at numbers that are higher than the peaks of previous surges, and that doesn't even take into account all the home testing that's being done that wasn't part of that those case numbers in some of the previous surges. So. Sure. So yeah, it gives me anxiety too. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I, knowing my son, I know he's still going to keep wearing his mask and and did even for like the twelve hour or the four hours it was optional uh, at the beginning of this uh, semester. But uh, yeah, it makes me a lot anxious too. I think it's a little early. I know. I'm always hoping and praying they're gonna they're gonna kind of go back on that. But yeah, she said we don't have to wear masks on Friday. I thought it was like you know how they have like PJ Day and you know bring your stuffed animal to school day. I go, oh, is it like a special day? She goes, no, it's like a new thing. I said, whoa. So yeah, it was a big it was a big shock. So we'll see. I think it concerns me because it's it's kind of the well, let's just see what happens kind of thing. Like yeah. let's take them off, see what happens, and then we'll decide if we need to go back on that. Um, if there's any reporters on the line. I think we do have somebody on the line, and then I've got a reporter question. Go ahead with yours. Okay, I'm going to go ahead with mine then. So KMBC has a question. Um, wondering if you could add to this about um, Senator Marshall introduced legislation um, to end the COVID-19 state state of emergency and was curious your thoughts, and Dr. Barr, I'm going to ask you as well. Do you think it's the right time to end it? 
Well, <clears throat> you know, clearly we don't focus on, on politics, but we do focus on uh, health and the science. And you know, what Dr. Barr was saying earlier, we're, the, the, the emergency is not over. The numbers aren't over. And so there are often things, whether they are federal or state um, <clears throat> declarations of emergency that are incredibly helpful that people don't even realize. And that may be access to the uh, National Guard. That may be uh, ways uh, that uh, allow for rules around telehealth and telemedicine mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. So there are a ton of things that are often wrapped up in those. So um, probably not my job to comment about the timing, but I think it is our job to say the emergency is not over. And there's still probably a lot wrapped up in the aid that those uh, declarations provide that we still need. All right, Dr. Nathan Barr, yeah. let us have it. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I must have really went off last time I was on here. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, we love your um, candid yeah. discussions. Well, you know, I think um, there, there seems to be a lot of effort to sort of say, push this aside. Um, we're done. And um, a lot of these sort of changes we're talking about seem to be aimed at sort of making those declarations. And, and I think I would just echo, we're not done. Um, there are a lot of sick people here. Um, there are still people dying in our hospital from this. And so when we talk about sort of moving on, pushing you know, this aside, that aside, we're, we're over it, we're not gonna do that. Um, I, I kind of think back to my patients that I've seen recently dealing with this disease in the hospital and I say it's not done for them it's not done for their families so it, it doesn't you know and, and man these levels are high this isn't like you know I'm saying a rare person these are big numbers of people in our hospital suffering from this disease so to me to try to be doing measures that are, are in, in part um, aimed towards sort of stating that this is done I think um, that that just strikes me as a little it's discongruent and it, with and our situation. And it's not done for the health care providers either. Right. Um, and, and to the point about deaths, as of Monday, well, last month we had 56 deaths from COVID. I think we had 20, just around 20 in uh, December. Last month we had 56. As of Monday, we have had 30 so far this month. It's 33 as of yesterday. 33 as of yesterday. We're averaging two to three deaths per day. So I just can't underscore enough it's not over for the families the patients but also the providers that are still taking care of um, these patients and, and dealing with with death every day and, and I think perhaps that's uh, you can probably detect a little emotion in my voice when I'm talking about this that's probably why you can detect that because um, uh, it, it, it really is is hard as, as somebody who's who's seen these patients trying to help them through it trying to talk families through it when they can't see their families to then be told you know when you're leaving work um, well, we don't need this anymore. We don't need that anymore. We're all good. It's, it's not. It's not the case. Well, and thanks for reminding. It's not the inconvenience of the mass mandate. So, yeah, it's the, the touchstone is the patient yep. and the people who are still dying um, of the disease. Dr. Hyland, I want to bring you in. Your thoughts. Uh, the, the state of emergency, what has it meant? And um, is the time now to, to let it go? Um, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Williamson, um, you know, being a health care provider, um, not getting into the politics of it, but I do think there are aspects that are very helpful. I think with getting supplies and being able to pivot faster um, when we do need, um, you know, for staffing situations, those kind of things, testing supplies, medications, you know, with the supply chain broken across the country, I think that um, we do need to have access to additional resources during this time. Dr. Vaughn, your thoughts? I would agree with that. I think it's it's a bit early to um, think that this is over and that we should not have a state of emergency because even though we've become a little bit numb to the news and how much this affects people because we hear it every single day, we are still living it every single day and the families that are affected are, are having a struggle. All right, well, when it comes to COVID-19 cases nationwide, overall things are somewhat pointing in a good direction. The latest data from the New York Times shows that the number of new cases have fallen across the U.S. by 77% since the peak was set back on January 14th. But the average daily cases are still higher than the peak of the Delta wave in the summer and fall of 2021. Dr. Williams, when you were, that was the first thing you said when you walked in here this morning. So uh, we do not want to forget that. Testing also declining. This could be because fewer people are 
are experiencing symptoms or also because again what we were mentioning those home tests that weren't typically reported or uh, during with those numbers so hospitalizations have also declined uh, to about a level of the delta peak but in rural areas the cases of covid remain higher so we want to turn to our guests and uh, john warden i want to get with you now how are you good morning to you and how is great bend good morning thank you um great bend as, as well as i was sharing this morning uh, it's quite windy you know we're in western kansas so but um you know i i just want to comment step back on your your last question with respect to the um you know ending um you know the, the declarations uh, states of emergency you know one one thing that i would comment with that that's very clear that numbers are still high you know which with you re referred to in the positivity overall transmissions but also as we we think about the number of patients that are being seen we still see a lot of patients um while our total inpatient bed numbers are not as high as they were you know three weeks ago or four weeks ago that was coinciding with the numbers that you just showed on the graphs with respect to peaks being mid-january we still see a lot of positive transmission and overall cases and that isn't just always in the acute care setting with patients that come through and admitted to the hospital, but what we see in our ERs, our urgent cares, our clinics, that volume has been significantly high in that burden with respect to the number of patients in the system. And that puts a significant pressure on our overall staffing. And by that, we have this chronic state now that we've been in for such a period of time with our team members that they're going through this, that while we can say we're going to be done with it, they're still living it all the time. They've been living it for a long period of time. And having just a, the, that last wave was a, a very significant acute crunch on them. And it impacts our team members just as much as it does patients. And so as we have patients that are out and affected by this, we also have team members and family members of, of people that are, that are part of our care team that experience it as well. And so it puts a significant burden um, as Dr. Hyland referred to with some of the staffing pieces as well. So um, the people who are just care providers, I, that that still continues to be an ongoing um, challenge for all of us, especially in rural settings. Um, it's much more difficult in times to pivot people and, and serve and make up those scenarios where people are out. So John, what are you seeing as far as just masking culture out where you are and also vaccination rate? Uh, can you share any information about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think masking has always been something um, that has been very, uh, it's, a, it's a hot topic amongst many people in rural settings. And that de definitely a viewpoints that a lot of them have um, with regards to, you know, school districts and those scenarios where people are saying, okay, now we're, we're pivoting. Uh, that's definitely been the case. And maybe so several weeks ago, as you saw in more rural communities that um, moved away from some of that. Um, no doubt, all the things that uh, Dr. Williamson, Dr. Highland, and Dr. Vaughn referred to with regards to why you would want to continue to use those pillars of infection control is, is, seems like the right answer, um, but definitely a scenario where it's probably not as followed as much what we see in the rural setting. Vaccination rates, however, are improving. Um, as we start to look at the overall national and then what's even here in Great Bend, um, we definitely start to see some movement on that. Um, our hospital and our team members are fully compliant and fully vaccinated um, to, as caregivers. But what we see is the overall community still being in this this region around 55 to, to 60 percent. Um, so, so the overall adoption rate, while it has ticked up some, um, probably still not at the overall level that we would love to see. Dr. Vaughn, um, I want to just bring you in. And John had mentioned a little bit about the employees, but just, what are you hearing about how employees are handling um, this latest surge? Sure. Well, as John said, you know, our staff are weary. They've been doing this for a long time and everyone's having workforce issues. But thankfully, more of our staff are healthy now. We did have a lot of people out uh, in the prior weeks, but back to having people back on staff, but they're working hard in this community. They have rallied and they have taken care of this community from the nursing staff, uh, APPs, physicians, our managers, our housekeeping, everyone has really rallied and worked hard to make sure they're taking care of this community. And doctor, I, I want to, let's talk about Dr. Highland. I want to talk about how things are going in St. Francis. What, do, what can you tell us about your numbers? 
Um, so we, we are seeing a decrease in our um, COVID positive numbers. Today we are at um, 17 positive and 12 recovered. And we continue to see, um, which I've been surprised about with the unvaccinated, it's 54%. And we're defining unvaccinated um, if they haven't received the, the two shot um, series. So we don't have that booster in there, which um, I recommend anybody to get um, vaccinated and boosted. Um, we do continue to see the same trend, um, you know, uh, across the state that we are seeing an increase in um, deaths as, you know, uh, we're kind of hitting that um, portion of the curve. Uh, as I said um, last week, we had 29 um, COVID related deaths in, in January, which is um, a significant increase with, that we've seen um, uh, out throughout the pandemic really ever at St. Francis. And so far in February, um, we have seen 12. Uh, so, you know, we're just at that part of the surge where it's, you know, really hits that frontline staff, particularly in the ICU and on the medical floor um, where they're seeing one to two deaths a day. Um, and they're just, you know, unfortunately getting used to it. And maybe, um, you know, as Dr. Bond said, we're, we're numb to it. Um, I continue to tell staff this is not normal. This is, you know, not what we want to expect um, in healthcare. We want people to come into the hospital and to be able to discharge home um, and to be with their family uh, or to, you know, get to their next level of care um, so they can be uh, with those that who love them and um, experience the best quality of life that they can. Um, so I do think that things are. Um, going a little bit better as far as the numbers and admissions and um, hospitalizations. But unfortunately, uh, this is um, just, you know, from an emotional standpoint, probably the, the toughest part of the curve uh, for us here at St. Francis. Burnout, COVID fatigue. I'm glad everyone has touched on that because I think when you say getting numb to it, it's such a mixed message, I think, for the public because anytime we hear the numbers are going down or we have less admissions or less deaths, um, I keep going back to what we were just saying. They're still higher than what we saw at the peak of the pandemic. It just shows how much that we're getting used to hearing that, that any any sign of decline means that it's time to lift mandates or it's okay to get it together. And it's just, um, I always just wonder what, what that, what message that sends to our community. Dr. Williamson, just does, is it a concern? I love hearing the good news, but there's, it just seems, you know. Yeah, it's incredibly confusing. And, and um, particularly for healthcare workers because they live this every day and then they go out into the community mm -hmm. and it's, you can't tell that COVID still exists and, and, and clearly it does. So um, there is that disconnect of, yes, numbers are coming down. They're coming down fairly rapidly but we're just to the point, I think, as Nate mentioned earlier, we, we would have been, we were terrified when we were at the numbers that we are currently are now. So, um, so we can't let our guard down. The actions we take still are gonna impact what the rest of this curve does. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, there is a, there's a big disconnect and there's just no way around that. So I wanna talk about transfers. Uh, when we talk about rural communities and other parts of the state and then how it impacts our health system and, and all health systems. Um, John, I wanna ask you about the story that we had shared um, a bit ago about a, um, there was a transfer that was coming, is that correct? There was a transfer that was coming, somebody who had sepsis? Is that what I understand? Um, that person ended up not making it to their destination, their transfer destination. Um, do we know what has changed since then? How are we working through this transfer issue? And then Dr. Williamson, I wanna hear what you have to say as well. It, this continues to be a problem <laughs> for rural, some, rural hospitals. And one of the things that's, that's been very struggling, especially in the past with, with the total number of just admissions to, to hospitals is how do we find ways for many smaller hospitals referring in even to a Great Bend kind of a, a bit of a regional area and then from a great bend for patients who have that higher level of need into a higher level tertiary center. Um, there are times when not only are the receiving facilities like in Kansas City or the Topekas or Wichita's are literally completely full, but we also then going back to the, the team members who transport the burden on those teams, like they are thin as well. We don't have as near as many transport teams. And so we've heard definitely stories and scenarios where not only our um, flight, you know, equipment is, is being used more, so it's, it's being serviced more, things just aren't, uh, they're just not as easily available to transfer 
patients because of all those additional burdens that we've had. And, and no doubt, um, sometimes we have patients that when we look at our just hard data on time to make it, we've made a decision where the patient either needs to be admitted and then that they need to go to potentially to onto a higher level care, that time is almost doubled. And so what we've seen is, is that typically it's anywhere from around 70 minutes to get the patient transferred. Um, and that's kind of preparing the patient, getting the receiving facility ready. We've seen that double and in some cases go way past that because finding a receiving facility is very challenging in today's time. Um, I know Dr. Williams probably has some numbers with regards to the overall transfer center and, and the number of requests made to them um, just there in Kansas City. But when, when providers, the stressors that Dr. Vaughn referred to with our team members doing an amazing job, they're advocating for these patients. They're trying to find a way to get them into the next level of care. Um, it takes multiple calls and it's a stress of, you can't just make one call and it's an easy transfer. I recently um, I had a conversation with kind of a neighboring CEO at a facility and we discussed the challenges of how do we even work together and maybe use um, our, our site here as a referral center. And then as times as we try and, and use some of our team members and making calls um, if we need to move a patient on to the next level of care. But um, all I can say is that our team in KC does an amazing job helping to try and help us um, when it's appropriate to get patients to the next level of care. Dr. Williamson, how are we doing with transfers? Yeah, it's still incredibly tight. Um, you know, last month we, I think, still had over 2,000 requests, and of that, probably around 20%. I don't remember the exact number we were able to accept. Um, and yes, the COVID numbers are coming down, but there's still lots of other diseases, other things people need to be in the hospital for. We've opened, and everyone across the, the, the state and the region are still tight on staffing, so staff beds become an issue. We've opened, I want to say, three units where at some of the best capacity we've had, uh, and um, three additional units, and we're still incredibly full, and it's still very, very hard for uh, patients to get here, and it's the same around the, around the region. We have great working relationships with St. Francis and Great Bend. They're a part of our system. Mm -hmm. And so nothing probably goes better than those transfers. And that's still incredibly challenging to help get those patients where they need to be uh, and, and everywhere else around. John touched nicely on some of the delays. And so some places are calling 30 or 40 or more places to find an accepting facility still. And then there's the, so there's that delay. There's the delay getting a transport to be able to get there. So all of the, the rigs may be in use or all of the flight services may be in use. And then there's the actual transport time. So we, we've seen substantial delays from the time that someone presents at a smaller ER that we know needs a, a different level of care to be able, able to actually get them here for all of, of those things. And what kind of patients are we talking about? Again, let's step away from COVID. Right. So it's 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 still the gamut. It's it's sepsis. It's heart attacks. It's stroke. It's trauma. It's all those those things. Um, you know, we're coming up um, into the summer season, so there'll be you know more more trauma um, in the rural setting. Some of the agricultural injuries. So it's 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 everything. It's and, and actually, sorry. I, <laughs> Oh, no. But uh, the, other, the other piece that we saw that sadly is often the case, particularly around the holidays, it's overdoses. You know, it's, it's um, suicide attempts in various uh, manners. So, and that's, again, unfortunately not uncommon around the holidays, but, but it, it's everything. So if COVID is not affecting you, and that's something you don't care about, you've got to care about all of these other things that are happening in the course of a lifetime. Because today, it still may be very hard if you have a heart attack at some place, you may not be able to get to a larger facility to get the care that you need uh, today. And you think about 134 patients, that's 134 beds that are going to one disease that could be, you know, used to help take care of all these other diseases. And it's the same in St. Francis and Great Bend and everywhere else. Dr. Barr, anything to add to that? What's the message? What should we be telling people? What do you want the community to know? Well, it's, it's about the whole community, right? So. Again, I think I would reiterate that if it's um, COVID is important, that's a risk we're talking about. We're also talking about the risk with any disease and simply not being able to get to the care you need. And and I think you know all of our our team here could tell you they've um, you know we've we've seen cases where um, you know the the, the patient uh, makes it in and uh, you know they've been trying to get here for a week before they get here. Um, 
that's a problem, right? And 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 I think what we're talking about also is just simply when a patient desperately needs, um, you know, that uh, access to that specific procedure, that specific type of doctor, things that um, are only available in certain centers, that needs to happen quick. And if it can't happen quick, that can be really bad for the patient. So it's not only COVID, it's, it's really any health problem. And so we really got to all be in this together, think about you know, think about we, it's a whole community and we, we all need to be trying to protect each other here. All right, I wanna to get to some community questions. So we'll go ahead and get to those and then we'll keep, we'll keep asking. Um, but Sandy has a question. Are there other communities or countries who have gone maskless already? And if so, what has been the outcome of that? And anyone can jump in, but have we heard of a real successful maskless community? I think that I, 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 I can't speak too well on this because I, I got to say I've been so involved in trying to keep our own system rolling that I haven't been as interested in um, the masking policies of other countries per se. Right. But I will say this, uh, yeah. regardless of where you're at, uh, these principles are true, right? So, um, you know, if, if you're in, in a tight indoor space, maskless with people with COVID, that's a bad situation. Um, the truth is we don't know oftentimes who has COVID and not. So you need to protect yourself and you need to protect others. Um, and, you know, that's a principle. It goes across settings. If you're in an area where you can, you know, be outside spread out from people, that's a, that's a safer way to be maskless, right? That's, that's those principles translate. Across, across the country and around the world. Yeah. Right. Okay. Dr. Vaughn, jump in here though, because I think um, sometimes there's a perception for maybe large cities that, those in rural communities aren't masking or vaccinating and aren't doing their part. But um, tell me a little bit about, kind of jump in on that question, if you would, um, about just maskless and, and um, how that's working and just what your insight is to that and what you see in that part of our state. Or sure. so, and I'll kind of um, put this in a little bit of perspective. So I live and practice in Lawrence and we're in Douglas County, which has a mask mandate. So, so my view is, is a little different when I come to Great Bend, which is where I am now looking, you know, so I'm very hyper aware when people don't have a mask on because I'm used to a very masked population. And I'll tell you, I went in the grocery store last night. I saw a lot of masks. All the employees had masks on here in Great Bend. So, you know, I think people are still following even in the rural communities, maybe not as much. But again, in my community, we have a mandate, so everyone is wearing masks out in public. Um, but I, I was very pleasantly surprised to see a lot more masks than I have seen in prior visits here in Great Bend. So I think that's reassuring that, that they are taking that seriously. They're protecting themselves, wanting to protect their neighbors and wearing masks. John, can you jump in on that? Any insight? Because we've been talking over the last couple of years uh, with you um, every so often out in Great Bend. And uh, have people now with this surge, are, are people taking it seriously? Because I know some people are. It's not that everyone isn't. So what, what, is your, what is your feel? What is the mood? Yeah, I think Sherry kind of is touching on what, what I would just call it. Like sometimes we stereotype some aspects of, you know, rural communities or people um, that they that they don't follow all those rules or they don't see the benefits of that. Um, and, I, and I don't know that that's always right. I mean, there's there's definitely some scenarios where that can happen. But I, I even talk to people so much as um, they're worried about their family members. They're worried about grandma or they're worried about a, a cousin or an aunt who potentially has an autoimmune disorder or is receiving chemotherapy. And so I see people doing many times the responsible thing and masking and asking a lot of questions even about, you know, hey, I've got my full vaccination. Is it, you know, booster time? When when should I consider another booster? I hear people asking questions that, you know, rewind a year ago, you know, people would say, oh, that, that doesn't seem like that would be congruent with rural settings. So I do think that there is um, more awareness. Um, and as Dr. Barr and others had mentioned, you know, thinking about the severity of this, is really impacted people now. When we, we think about in rural settings, these rural communities, including here, have lost people with COVID. And that has a, a big ripple in small communities when you look at the lives and people that it touches past that. And so others are, are, are aware, and there are definitely times and scenarios that we continue to see people who are, are very vigilant in many different ways. 
Right. Dr. Hyland, I uh, want to bring you in as well. Just, I mean, uh, it's nice to hear stories where, where the, you know, every, I think we've talked about this, Dr. Williamson, on the show, where it just takes people time. You know, what, whatever they come to the table and whenever they get vaccinated and whatever happens in their life that makes them want to get off the fence, um, we welcome that. And we're, we're excited to hear that. Uh, Dr. Hyland, you know, just what, what message do you want about, uh, want people to know about just, you know, even when mas- mandates are lifted, um, that they can still, people can still mask and just how that affects um, the trickle effect when it comes to places like Topeka, uh, Kansas City, all these places where there's other hospitals and those rural uh, folks are coming in. How, how does that trickle down effect work and how important is it? Yeah, well, I, well, I think masking is um, one of several of the solid infection control tools that we that we have. Um, you know, as a practicing anesthesiologist, you know, one of the things that I have to do every time I walk into the OR is to make sure I have a mask on to make sure that it remains as sterile as possible for those patients who are at risk. Um, so it's something that I'm very used to, um, and those that I'm around are very used to. One of the things that I found confusing at the beginning of the pandemic was the because we didn't have enough masks, the communication to the public was that eh, you, you really don't need it. And I think that was a very confusing message because we didn't have enough and we didn't want to, you know, what happened with toilet paper. We didn't want everybody running after all the masks. So the frontline caregivers who are taking care of those who are immunocompromised and in surgery didn't have what they need needed. And so um, I think it's one of the, you know, one of the several tools that we have. So masking, physical distancing, getting vaccinated, and washing your hands. So I think that um, taking into account who you're around, how many people you're around, are they vaccinated? Are they immunocompromised? Are they at risk? Um, are, you know, um, what is the percent positivity rate in your community? So I think we can flex up and down. Um, I know that there are issues with wearing masks. I know that as an anesthesiologist, when I need to examine the patient, um, I have to take off their mask because I have to see their airway. I have to be able to communicate with my patients. A lot of them can't hear when I have a mask on. And so I have to take my mask off so they can read my lips. So there is, I think we need to be flexible and use common sense. Um, And I think kindness is another part of it. But um, I know I feel safer when I'm in a group and, you know, other individuals are are wearing their masks, Um, particularly if I'm with my mom, who, you know, is older and more at risk than I am. Um, So so I think that there's, it's not cut and dry. It's not black and white. Um, So I think that uh, and, and as we move along in this pandemic, we're learning so much, you know, in the rural communities, you know, kind of seeing what it does when you don't get vaccinated or you don't have your mask on and how that impacts your community. So I think that um, we're all learning and, and getting through this. And I think kindness and common sense go, goes a long way in using those infection control tools. Isaac wants to know of the current hospital census here at KU, what is the proportion of patients from counties outside of the Mark region? Do we know? I don't know. We, and you don't, you aren't expected to know. I didn't, we didn't know that question was coming, I, but is that something we would I, know I, I, and could I, I find fe- out? I failed the first question, man. That's all right. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, that, that's something we have. We, we can collect that data on for sure. Okay. Cause I think people want to know who is being transferred in and how many people are yeah. coming from other communities. That, that data is obtainable for sure. Okay. Question from Tammy, uh, recently read in the New York times, there could be an undiscovered coronavirus. Is that just an undiscovered variant? Dr. Barr, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah. I, so I, I haven't, I haven't read this, but I've kind of heard, I guess, whispers about this. I, I'm, I maybe. um, I'm sorry if I'm not addressing exactly what the concern is. I think um, there are certainly worries about new variants popping up. There are certainly um, worries that, you know, a new coronavirus, totally new coronavirus could pop up, right, the same way um, that we've had other pandemics. That's always possible. Um, You know, the more, in terms of variants, obviously, the more transmission that happens, that allows more opportunities for new variants to come about. So um, it's a worry. I think it's something we need to monitor. I'm, you know, I'm thankful that um, 
there have been a number of countries around the world that have done really excellent job monitoring for variants. South Africa comes to mind as one that's done an absolutely extraordinary job monitoring for variants. Um, and the U.S. has built up their capacity a lot in the last number of months. So, um, so I'm hopeful that you know we can catch the next variant should it come um, quickly, so that you know we know what we're dealing with. We can prepare that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, we need to stay vigilant and we need to you know be monitoring to make sure that if that does happen, we're ready. Safe to and, say, a new variant is inevitable. Uh, yeah, I okay. think. I think it's safe to say a new variant's invariable, and, and um, we hope that those will be milder because the, that actually is to the advantage of the, the virus itself, but we don't know that. And so we've there's probably going to be other variants, and we'll just have to watch those over time. And COVID isn't the only virus out there, just to remind folks that there are other viruses and, and, and um, that we have to keep an eye on as well. All right, Patricia's asking, what percentage do you all suspect are unrecorded positive, especially now with the home tests and the rapid tests? Percentage of? Percentage of unrecorded positives. You mean like rapid tests that we don't know about currently? Right, right? or people taking home tests that don't get recorded. Yeah, like, I, I guess I don't know, right, because they're not recorded. Don't know. <laughs> so uh, I guess that's what I would go with. We don't but, know what we don't know? Yeah, I mean, it, it all depends on, you know, availability of rapid tests and what people's um, routine is going to be after that, right? So, um, you know, if you get a rapid test and you're feeling very ill, you may well need to go to the hospital, in which case we'll record that. But we know that for many people that wouldn't be what's happening, right? Many people may simply take the rapid tests, stay at home, isolate themselves, and, and you know, we may never know about that test. So it's probably and a it decent chunk, but I don't know. necessarily because they're not spreading it. Yeah, and that's, that's to the point I think <clears throat> I touched on earlier is the uh, those case numbers don't include the, the home testing. And we know particularly, you know, talking to you know, friends and family and colleagues, in December, January, and February, there were a ton of people doing home tests, mm -hmm. because, partly because it was hard to get in to get, you know, PCRs, and the wait was several days in, in some places. And so, and then, of course, you know, most people receive their home COVID test in the mail. I got mine last week, that my, my four test. And so, um, that we'll, we'll never know what that exact number is, other than it's a lot higher than what we're actually seeing on the curves. So, will this eventually become the endemic, the endemic that we have talked about in the past. I mean, when, will it and when will it? <laughs> when, when's harder. <laughs> okay, I told you we have one crystal ball question every show. So, so June second at yes. seven fifteen p.m. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, so I, I don't know. Clearly, the numbers are headed in the right direction. If and if they continue to do that, I think we all have hopes that we'll maybe emerge out of the pandemic as we get into to late spring and, and certainly I defer to Dr. Barr maybe in terms of timing. Um, so I think we will get to endemic. People maybe use that word a little too reassuringly and I don't want to always be doom, doom and gloom. Right. I can take a room down but um, but endemic doesn't mean over. It means that right. it's just here and part of what we deal with means seasonal and there's lots of things that are endemic that still cause a lot of you know uh, we still have to worry about. So malaria in, in, um, in, in uh, East Africa, for example, is endemic, but, and it causes lots of death. But it's not good. Closer to the home, influenza, endemic, and we have years where it causes lots of disease and death. So it doesn't mean that we can just let our guard down. It still means we're still going to have to take certain precautions, particularly at certain times of year. And vaccinate, just like you do for the flu. Vac boost. Be careful, kind of, you know, don't yeah. be around sick people. Don't come to work sick. So that's what Joe Ellen's question was, uh, just asking what is the situation with flu cases right now? It was a nice surprise. So yeah. we actually did not have the flu season that we uh, were afraid that we might. And so in terms of hospitalizations, we had very few hospitalizations, I would say a couple a week maybe. Mm -hmm. And overall nationally, we didn't have uh, the, the flu season we, we worried. There are other viruses that have flared a little bit. We heard from uh, Children's Mercy, they're seeing a lot of human metanumavirus, which is another winter virus that uh, that we see. But fortunately, it was a, a I can much better flu for human metanumavirus being brutal this year. Yeah. What is that? Uh, can you just pronounce one more time? Say it again. <laughs> human metanumavirus. It's a it's another respiratory virus, and uh, yeah. Uh, our family got it from uh, from daycare, and boy, was it fun! <laughs> what happens when you get it? I, I mean, it's 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 certainly in most cases nowhere like what we're talking about with COVID. It's just makes. But you, is it fluish? Yeah, yeah, fluish makes you feel rotten. 
Okay. Or, cough, cough, fever, yep. and in immunocompromised folks like patients with transplants, and I mean yep. it can be can very be dangerous, deadly. Yeah. Okay, Isaac has a question. Don't be a buzzkill, Dr. Williamson. <laughs> but he says, so are you saying that we'll never be normal again? Um, I think there'll be a new normal. I don't think it will go back to exactly what it was before. Um, I think it will be much, much, much better. You know, early on in this uh, pandemic, um, I saw a patient who was in, um, hospitalized with um, H1N1 type of flu. And that was something we had worried about as, as, a, as a pandemic, you know, years ago. And, and it was just treatable and she got through it and it was just part of something. So, you know, we've got better, we, you know, the vaccines work. We have better uh, therapeutics coming down the road. We continue to develop new therapeutics, things that will treat this. So I don't know what the new normal is. It's probably not exactly what we had before. Okay. Um, I probably am gonna, during the winter months, indoors, wear my mask, mm -hmm. and, you know, and um, I think we'll see more of that from, from some people. Um, it, it's gonna be a lot, lot better though. You okay, know. you didn't totally bring the room I'm, down. Well, I'm getting better. You're Here getting you. better, I love that. I'm gonna jump in and I Please don't do. think I'm gonna break, bring the room down either. Okay, um, I, I, I actually wanna, I, I would just refer a little bit to what Dr. Hyland was discussing earlier. So, you know, I think part of what getting to to some semblance of normal is going to take is flexibility on everyone's part so that when we see cases, um, you know, have been, say cases have been very low and we start hearing that, oh, there's, it's starting to rise again, we're seeing problems, people need to, you know, if they've been going on masks, pick their masks back up. You know, there's things like that where um, flexibility is going to need to happen in that direction as well where people are willing to sort of take precautions again when we've been able to be um, a little looser. Um, you know, we, if you know, remember a number of months back, right, we got down to single digit cases in our hospital and we were feeling pretty good and we were, you know, we were hoping things were going to be all right in the near future. We had to adapt, right? Things have, things have changed. We had to adapt. We had to um, really, really hunker down and try to get through this. And that's what we need going forward is, is um, that flexibility to understand when, uh, you know, when it's getting bad, we need to act like it. We need to, we need to um, try to, you know, protect quickly and not sort of, I don't want it. I hate it. It's, you know, that's not helpful. It's not what we need. Dr. Hyland, I want to get to some final thoughts, and I was hoping I could ask you a question with that. Um, thank you all, first of all, for being with us today. But Dr. Hyland, I want some final thoughts from you. And then also just with that, Ashley's asking, do we ever see a day where our, our doctors and medical professionals will, will suggest to civilians, uh, no longer suggest to civilians to not wear masks in public? Think we'll ever see that day. So ask, ask that, that last question again for- So just um, asking oh. if there'll ever be a time when doctors tell us uh, that we no longer have to wear masks in public. I, and I think I think we will get there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I don't know when we'll get there. I think outside is safer than inside. I think fewer people is safer than more people and vaccinated individuals is safer than non-vaccinated. So again, it's that flexibility and kind of knowing where you are and the risks that, um, that present themselves. And kind of in, in final um, thoughts, I think that um, we've learned a lot uh, through this pandemic. One of the things that I have, um, that I'm very grateful for is the ability to work with so many different individuals and different organizations and learn how all the different systems work and how we can make them better. I think that the new normal will be better than what the normal was before. I think we have to remember that every day is a new day and one day does not look like the next and that's what makes life exciting. Um, and I think the more kindness and respect that we can bring to each new day, I think makes it even better. And um, currently in this pandemic, I think if we can, um, you know, I think wearing a mask does you know, kind of show other people that you that you care about them and you don't want to get your germs on them. And what we've seen with the flu uh, and wearing a mask, it, it proves that it works, you know, um, that it, it does reduce the amount of, um, you know, different diseases that we spread amongst each other. We're not going to bring that to zero, um, you know, 
and uh, but just to continue to be kind and respectful to each other and to understand that the hospitals and the clinics and the healthcare professionals are a part of the community and, and they do need your support so they can take care of you the best that they can. Dr. Hyland, thanks so much for being with us today. Dr. Vaughn, your final uh, thoughts for us. Well, COVID has kind of taken over all of our thoughts, our conversations, and um, it has made a lot of people be very divisive, even in their personal relationships. So God gave us two ears and one mouth. Let's use them in that capacity, listening more than we're talking and see, you know, listen to each other, find some areas that we can agree on and let's get through this. Well said. Thank you so much for being with us, John. Final thoughts from you out there in Great Bend. Um, well, I just want to share one of the things that I've been most impressed with through all of this is um, just call it connectedness and support so of our own team locally, how we band together during these times of call it crisis and acute moments um, to all try and lean in and do the best thing. And it's also about the connectedness of being with how I've seen the health system span across the state help even here in Great Bend. And then as I even look with Dr. Highland and other teams, as, as I think about how we've collaborated and learned from each other so that we can go back to, as we go forward and looking back to what our new normal is, um, things will be different. And part of that will be how we all work together in a way for the what's best for the patient and working more deeply with the relationships we have as care providers. Oh, I love that. Thanks so much, John. Good to see you. Uh, Dr. Barr, I'm going to get your final thoughts, but I have to seek in a couple of quick questions from our viewers, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Any correlation, Lou wants to know, between vitamin D deficiency and COVID? So, um, well, when we talk about correlation, that's, that's a little tricky, right? So correlation just means, um, you know, are there studies out there that have seen, um, you know, more COVID or severe COVID with people with vitamin D deficiency with, than without? And so um, there have been, you know, there have been some studies that have said that. So they have said simply, well, you know, COVID um, can happen more in people with vitamin D deficiency than without. But the problem is folks that have vitamin D deficiency often have many other um, comorbidity, comorbidities, many other medical problems. And so, um, so if you're vitamin D deficient, you should treat that. Um, but the reason to treat it isn't really COVID. Um, the reason to treat it is is simply the con the consequences of vitamin D deficiency, um, and so it's certainly worth talking about with your doctor. But we haven't seen any evidence, for instance, that vitamin D is helpful in in treating COVID or preventing COVID. All right, leave us some lasting words of wisdom. All right, um, let's do I'll it. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would just try to reiterate a few things. Um, uh, we actually haven't talked as much about vaccination today, and I didn't drop in the, the components of that with our numbers. But one thing I will say is that it continues to be very clear in our numbers that um, being vaccinated and boosted is an extremely helpful thing to protect yourself and from, from COVID-19. Um, when we look at severe outcomes and deaths, um, vast majority, 90 plus percent, are, are not completely vaccinated and boosted. So that's one thing where, you know, the question about are we ever going to get to normal, I, I understand that, right, because it is getting us to, um, to that, it, it, it expresses kind of a despair, right? This is terrible. It's been going on for so long. We're all sick of it. Is our, what can we do about it? There are things we can do about it. And I think that's, you know, probably what I want to emphasize the most. You can do things to protect yourself. You can get vaccinated and boosted. That's going to offer you a lot of protection. It's also going to offer people you love um, protection by being boosted. If you have kids that can't yet be boosted and vaccinated, you doing so is helping to protect your children. So, you know, don't don't despair. I I I, I get it. Uh, I find myself there sometimes too with this. Uh, I look at these numbers and it, it really is not a happy place. But remember, there are things you can do to get yourself through it, to get your family through it, and to help your community through it. Um, we're all in this together. If we do our part, we can we can make our way. Dr. Barr, thanks so much for being with us today. Dr. Yep. Williamson, help us land the plane. <laughs> what do you got to tell us? Well, I I want to echo the words of my very wise colleagues, and they, they've all said it beautifully. Um, I, I read a really great article in the uh, uh, Atlantic, I think it was last week, and it really talks about, you know, as we transition, we, we're not going to have either end of the spectrum. We're not going to have these drastic lockdowns, but we're also probably not going to be running into large 
groups of people unvaccinated and unmasked. And so how do we navigate that? And and I think part of it is finding, you know, figuring out who's the most vulnerable person in your circle, and that may be you, mm -hmm. and how do you protect and how do you uh, kind of constantly make the decisions about how you protect yourself and those vulnerable people in, in your circle or your bubble, the vaccination with boost, masks. Um, and and there's, there's no doubt that these things work. And the, what's distressing, I think, to all of us is the just vast amount of misinformation that's out there. Mm -hmm. And if we can figure out a way to combat that, that that's been deadly. But we're, we're, we're headed to a much better place. And the way that we continue to get there is masking and in, in the right settings, mm -hmm. not outside. But if you're indoors in a crowded space, that's probably the right place to wear a mask. But you Vaccination. Both, I mean, let's let's do it. And you both said it. It's if you don't want to think of the entire world or the country or the community, think of that one person that you love that needs the most protecting, and do it all based on that. Absolutely. That's a really good message to send. All right. Thanks to all of our guests. Great conversation. We appreciate you so much. Uh, tomorrow. We told you about this. We're launching a brand new program focusing on the heart, and it's called All Things Heart. Alexis Del Cid will host this show, and each episode will highlight amazing patient stories, care teams, and physicians who specialize in cardiac care. This week, we focus on COVID's effect on the heart. And just like the program here, you're going to be able to ask questions live to Alexis, all about things hard. So join us here at eight o'clock um, on our show and then stick around for the brand new program that starts again tomorrow at 10 a.m. Now, finally, this morning, we're talking about the power of giving back as a way of saying thank you to all those Chiefs fans out there for donating nearly $500,000 to the Children's Hospital in Buffalo. They have now donated 300 pennants to the Children's Mercy Hospitals here in Kansas City. And the pennants read, sportsmanship always wins. Um, so again, this was all about, um, this all got kicked off, you know, when they kind of were teasing in that 13 seconds. And so they, they really ramped it up donated kids so kids in buffalo are taken care of and now our kids here in kansas city so i think that when, when the chiefs didn't go i think when you hear things like that that's some good news so that we get to hear with that so we appreciate that um also want to talk about uh what's coming up tomorrow closing ceremonies for the winter olympics are coming up um, in just a few days we're going to talk about um sports medicine we've got two sports med medicine physicians here at the health system um, they're going to talk about the effect covid has had on the games and how it's also impacting athletes. Uh, we're going to talk about working with elite athletes and how that impacts some of our local high school and college players here in our city. So we'll talk all about that tomorrow. Um, so have a fantastic day and we'll see you back here tomorrow at 8 a.m. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.